record so I can officially welcome everyone. Happy Tuesday, happy garbage day to our only class this week. Yeah, so let's open with that just so you all remember. <laughs> what? I'm not allowed to say y'all? No, I just, just how we're starting. I enjoy it. <laughs> I told you I'm in one of those moods and so I got to hit like the highlights first or I'm going to forget. No class Thursday. Jonathan and I are hosting a conference that starts tomorrow and so I will be unavailable. Um, no homework to work on right now other than to figure out what you want to do for homework for. So I'll still be on email when I can, just not as regularly as I usually am. Um, all the TAs have canceled their office hours for the rest of this week, too. So it's just sort of a little fall break, maybe. It's like we're a private college. Yeah, like an actual fall break, as it should be. So we're at week eight, which I think is the halfway point of the semester, so that's, that's fitting. So yes, uh, no, nothing yet to do except figure out what you want to do with formative, or no, homework for. I'll let you know when the next formative assessment is ready. And the TAs have been given access to your next homework, and so they get a head start. I plan to release it to you on the 16th. That way you have two full weeks to work on it. It will be a, maybe a slight order of difficulty more complex because the models are more complex with random slopes and cross-level interactions and that kind of stuff. But uh, I will remind you that you can always ask for help whenever you need it. And even on the drop-down questions, if you can articulate your logic, I can help confirm or deny whether your logic is correct. And on that note, I wanted to share something with you. So my third grade son brought home a little math workbook that they had finished, and I was flipping through it. And I noticed this gem here. I had to show it to you. Which statement describes the number of speed limit signs? Explain your reasoning. B, because it's right. <laughs> So maybe not so good with the spelling, but I love the indignation that that answer conveys. My reasoning is that it's the right answer, duh. So maybe more explanation than this as to why you think something is right, but there was nothing circled on it, so apparently he was correct that it was the right answer. So that's my boy. <laughs> Talking back to his teachers already. Following in, in his parents' footsteps, I think. Isn't it you who said, right or wrong, be confident? Uh, yes, it, it's better to be wrong than vague, Yes, was what I was told. So be confident of your wrong answer was sort of the, the, the pitch to that. But we're only going to have right answers today, right, folks? Oh, sure. Oh. Right or confident. Or right and confident. Yes. But not wrong and vague. That's the only combination that doesn't work here, so... How about we look at an example to start with? That way we can review some concepts and see how to ex actually execute the concepts, which is the important thing here. Um, this example I built a couple of weeks ago as a new version. I've used this example for many years because it's a really good one. It's one of the few that I have that are real data. So I did some selection to make sure that all schools had at least 30 students, uh, but otherwise I did not mess with these data. These are real. They are from the math test at the end of 10th grade in a Midwestern rectangular state. Narrows it down somewhat, but not exclusively. We have uh, almost 14,000 students from 94 schools in this state, somewhere between 31 and 515 students in each school with an average of 139. So the only predictor that I'm interested in today is actually a categorical person level predictor for whether or not a student gets full price lunch some kind of reduced lunch or free lunch. And I'm treating this as ordinal in the way that I'm thinking about it. So the higher your uh, value for this, the more disadvantaged you are thought to be. Um, free and reduced lunch is often used as some sort of proximity for poverty or lack of resources. I know there's some issues with that in terms of like theoretically what that represents. Um, I just wanted to give you an example of what a categorical predictor would look like and how to work with that. So. Um, the most of this example is going to treat this as dichotomous, but then we'll throw in another predictor that differentiates the reduced free lunch cases. So that's my story. All right, ready to do this? Cool, excellent. So usual steps, importing data, I copied it over to Excel, added some labels for what we're looking at here, some descriptive statistics. So in terms of the frequencies here, about 69% of the students, so this is in the student level data set, uh, fit, pay full price for lunch. I'm going to represent that in my variable names with a P for paid. 
Um, about 9% gets reduced lunch and the remainder gets free lunch. So the way that I'm going to code this ordinal variable is, as usual, if I have three groups, how many slopes do I need to differentiate three groups? This is not a multi-level question. This is like a regression question. I need two, right, for three groups. And I could set it up however I want. The reason that I only need two is because one of the group means is going to become the intercept. So I just need to have somebody as the reference group and then deviations from the other groups. So the way that I decided to do this is useful when you have ordinal information like this, where I'm making one predictor that I'm naming PVRF. That stands for paid versus reduced or free lunch. So this is differentiating the children who pay full price from those who get some kind of discount. So if I just split this variable into a binary distinction, this is what it would look like. Subsequently, and later about halfway through the models, we're going to also add in this predictor, which is paid or reduced versus free. So this is going to change the reference for what the first variable means to the difference specifically between paid and reduced, then this one takes us from reduced to paid. So I call this sequential coding. It's useful because when you put all the slopes in the model, what you get is the transition between adjacent categories rather than each group relative to a single reference group, which would be more useful if this was a nominal scale. Okay, with me so far? Any questions on that idea? So this is my one variable yet you won't believe what all we're going to do with it. <laughs> so here's how I set up the coding in Stata. First, generating some empty columns and then systematically turning them into zeros and ones for each of these cases here, adding in some labels for proper documentation. Uh, doing the same thing, um, I'm making indicator variables for each type of lunch. This is going to be useful for descriptive purposes to make sure that my coding works. So I'm adding that. I'm not going to end up using them in the analyses, though. This is just something I'm doing to check my coding. Um, but then I also need to represent differences across schools in their school composition with respect to this variable. So if these are the two predictors that are eventually going to go into my model here, I need to make sure that I take the school mean for each of them. So as a general concept, any level one predictor that has level two variability in it, you need a school mean or a cluster mean for that predictor. So I need two different school means because I have two different dummy coded variables here that are going into my model. So in Stata, that's one line of code for each new variable, which is nice. I then did the extra work to create a school level data set. In my prior example, in, uh, with example three and in your homework, I took a shortcut and just looked at all of this within one data set, but I wanted to make sure and do it properly this time. Uh, I have a question from the Zoomers. Can I say it again? Which part? <laughs> I can say it. That's something my son would say. <laughs> How to prepare data with level two. Yes. So my original predictor is this ordinal variable. Can I take the school mean of that? Would it mean anything? Not really. These are not numbers. These are kinds. So what I'm creating the school mean of to become a level two predictor at, for cluster differences is these two variables. I need a mean of this binary variable and I need a mean of this one. Because that's what's actually going into the model. Okay, does that help? Okay, excellent. So here is a school level data set. Stata folks, do you know how to do these steps? Is this old news or should I go over this? Please go over it. Okay, I had to figure this out. This is not non-trivial. So in Stata, at least in the way that most people I've seen in practice use it, you only have one data set open at a time. I think there's some kind of frames or something in newer versions of Stata that allow you to have multiple. Have you guys played with this at all? Okay, yeah. I, it hasn't really caught on as near as I can tell because all of the examples I see online are still working from this thing. So what you can do is in the data set at this moment, up to this point in the code, it's a student level data set. 
these are new school columns that got merged in that are constant over the rows for students from the same school. So I'm saying preserve, meaning, wait, I'm, I'm going to need this back. Don't, don't really erase it. Just like pretend like you did. Collapse all of these variables by school ID. So this is basically compressing the data into one row per cluster per school. I'm then adding a format statement to control the number of decimals that would get uh, printed. That's something I like to do to make things look pretty and then asking to be summarized. And so this is from SAS, but this is what the data set would look like in Stata. It's now 94 cases because this is a school level data set. So that's how you can tell how many students you actually have per school on average. If I were to compute this number in the original student level data set, it's actually way different because there's a lot of variability in the number of students for each of these schools. I made sure that there was a minimum of 31, but it goes all the way up to 500. And this is just 10th grade, by the way. So we have ranges in terms of math. So this is our outcome variable. I asked for school means for that just for descriptive purposes. That's not something I'm going to use in my analysis, but it is something that I could use, you know, for correlations or means and that kind of thing. So it looks like on average school mean math ranges from about 30 to about 60 with an average of 47. Then we get into the binary variables. So this first one right here, 30% of the students get free or reduced lunch. That's what that means. 0 0.30 is the proportion. The second variable is a one only for students who get free lunch. So you're like, wait, how does that math work out? This is why I made these additional variables. <laughs> so in total, CM lunch zero is one if you have a score of zero, meaning you get paid lunch. This one is one if you're reduced, and this one is one only if you're free. So here's where it sums to one. 70% of the, of the um, hang it, on average, in a school, 70% of the students pay for lunch fully, 11% get reduced lunch, and 19% get free lunch. So this is relevant for thinking about how we're going to center the level two predictors to create what a representative school would be. Because if I left it alone, like at this cluster mean level, if I left these alone, then they would represent a school where all of the children pay full price for lunch. That's what a zero would mean. And that isn't useful. So what I chose to do is center my predictors such that the reference school looks like this. So the first variable I subtracted 0.3 from. That means that 30% of the students have either reduced lunch or free lunch. For the second predictor that differentiates reduced from free, I center that at the proportion of students who get free. So this combination creates the reference school with that profile. This will be relevant when trying to make plots to show what happens because you can't show all different possibilities without exceeding a probability of one in terms of the proportion of students in various combinations. So I'm coming up with like a school composition for a reference type school that has this breakdown of students. So at level two, my predictors are going to be cluster mean, added an underscore because that was just too many letters in a row, paid versus reduced or free, centered at 0.3, cluster mean, paid or reduced versus free, centered at 0.19. So this one's not going to be part of the story yet. We're going to start with just the first one for now. I also created cluster mean centered versions of each of these variables that are going to be used in the random part of the model. And because it was drilled into me at a young age, I add labels for every. Future you will thank you. Even if you can't add the labels to your data like an R, it will yell at you sometimes if you have labels in your data frames. Have them in your syntax at least. That will help future you and future people working with you. Okay, how are we doing so far? Any questions on the logic or the setup of this? So looking at the distribution of these last three variables here, it ranges from 0.2 to 0.1 in terms of the number of students who pay for lunch. The number of students in a given school who get reduced lunch ranges from 0 to 
and the number of students who get free lunch goes all the way up to 68%. So I don't need to compute an intra-class correlation for this variable to tell you that there's significant school variance here. And we we're definitely <laughs> need to be on the lookout for contextual effects. I will compute an intra-class correlation to show you how, but just looking at this tells you what you need to know. Schools differ quite a bit in their composition with respect to this variable. So our folks, I'm not gonna leave you out. We are using uh, Jonathan's functions again to do various things, thank you very much. Here are the labels that I can't add to the data frame or it will yell at me. I'm going through the same process of creating empty dummy codes here with the NAs and then systematically replacing them into zeros and ones based on the coding scheme described in this table. So just doing the same thing using our code. Then we need to filter to complete cases. So we're keeping everything consistent across all of the computations and analyses. This function gives level two means for each of the variables listed here. So doing the same thing as I did in Stata with separate lines of code. Then I learned a new thing, also from Jonathan, thank you. Uh, this function unique, I had not seen that before. It does the same thing. It collapses across um, all the students from the same school to create a school level data set, which I named school means. And then I can run descriptives on that specifically and get the same information out that we saw in this table. So all the same stuff. So then I'm creating my centered level two predictors for composition and my within cluster centered versions of those predictors that we'll need eventually as well. All right, questions or comments? It's a tidyverse thing, but distinct is another, um, if you wanna keep things in tidyverse. In tidyverse, yeah, so I like messyverse. I'm, I'm not a tidy person. Tidyverse is being cliche. Yeah, well, Jonathan really hates tidyverse, and since he's the person I go to for help on things, I, I get this version of it. But I'm generally a fan of code that is transparent, mm -hmm. and the tidy code with all the weird symbols and stuff is whatever untransparent means. Is that a word? Yeah. In, in transparent? Bad fake. is what it means. Fake. Yeah, so... I can tell for the most part like what's happening when I look at this and that's reassuring especially when you're teaching people who don't know how to do this how to do something. So if you know how to do things with less code more efficiently, knock yourself out. All right. So then first thing always empty model. This is not for pedagogical purposes. This is for reporting purposes. We have to know how much of our variability in our outcome is at each level so that we can get a sense as to what level of predictors is going to be relatively more important. So we have math scores. This is an empty two level model here. So beta zero C is my latent variable placeholder. At level two gets a fixed intercept and a random intercept. So each cluster gets to have its own mean in this case. So this represents all of the variability in math that there is to be had. So here's a state of code and output here first. Try, try and change it up across programs. So constant, what's that thing? I quit labeling, by the way. So this is where I'm taking the training wheels off, piece by piece. What's that thing? What is it? It's the mean. So what symbol does it go with up here? Yeah, that's right here. This is my... Fixed intercept is the way I would call that. This is the mean of the school means with respect to my math outcome. And I do have to say it that way because of the random intercept. It's not just the straight mean of this variable because of the unbalance across schools and the number of children that are being included. Uh, what's this number? 45. It's which one? Uh, is it the U0C or is it something else related to that? Because U0C is for one school, right? That's what the C means? So you're, you're in the right neighborhood. It needs three more words. The blank of U0C. 
Uh, that's three words, I'll take it. I was going with variance, but random intercept variance for the win, yeah. So this is level two or level one? Level two, yes. Is this a cluster thing or a people thing? Cluster, yes. So this is the variance across clusters, 45. That means 253 here has to be what? The rest of it? The rest of it. The rest of it. <laughs> Correct. Uh, which symbol does that go with? The E. But is it the E or is it something about the E? Yeah, it's the, the variance of the EPC. Yeah, this is level one residual variance. Differences across children from the same school. And the thing that I really need to know about those two numbers is right here, the intraclass correlation. What's that tell me? Uh, right idea, wrong word for amount. Make it sound standardized. Closer. There we go. Yep. 0.15 is the proportion out of one of variance that is at the school level in mean differences. 15% or proportion of 0.15. You can say it other way. Most of it is level one. Chris, correct. Yep. This 0.15 is the proportion of variance out of one that is due to school mean differences in math. That means 85% is within school differences between kids who go to the same school. Most of it's kid level, as you might expect. So this is actually a pretty strong intraclass correlation for a cluster data set like this. It's like 0.05-ish, 0.1 is where that usually tends to live. So in R, not going to leave you all out. Here's your 45, my level 2 random intercept variance, my 253 level 1 residual variance across people, my fixed intercept of 0.47. The significance test for it I had to ask for via RANOVA. I'll spare you the usual joke on that. Test statistic is 1800 and something. Yeah, I'd say 0.15 is definitely greater than zero. That's what this is telling me. This is a model comparison against a model that doesn't have a random intercept variance. That would assume that 15% is zero. Decidedly not zero. That number, by the way, in this data output is right here. So both of these, you can find that. So in practical terms, what is the consequence of having an intraclass correlation this large for our power to detect student level effects? Does it make it better or worse that it's a big intraclass correlation? For student level effects. Stronger intraclass correlation correlates with a stronger design effect, which is your penalty factor. Worse. It's worse. So I can actually compute a design effect. We haven't talked about this in a few weeks, so I thought I'd bring it back. You know, play the greatest hits. Here's my design effect. Uh, let me make, let's change that notation. There we go. Level 1n minus 1 times the intraclass correlation creates a design effect of 22. Holy crap. So that means that my 13,082 kids, in terms of the amount of unique information they provide, is about 600. Yeah. So this is a very strong clustering effect, very strong design effect in this case. Uh, because I have a lot of kids per school, though, on average, the intercept reliability, or ICC2 as it is sometimes known, is very strong as well, 0.96. And last but not least, I've got a confidence interval so that I can help school principals understand what the hell this means. 
right? You got to bring it back down to the people who care about these results. So on average, math scores are about 48 in this sample, but the extent of random intercept variance around them, the 45, if I take the square root of that, that turns it into a standard deviation. So the mean plus or minus two standard deviations gives me a range of this. So that's how variable my schools are in their mean math performance. 95% of the schools are expected to have somewhere between about 35 and 60, assuming a symmetric distribution. So that's quite a bit of variability. All right, how are we doing? Is this feeling like comfortable-ish? Maybe like, I don't know, what angle is this? This is 90, right? So maybe 80? Or 110? <laughs> if I go the other way? <laughs> <laughs> so we have a free and reduced lunch predictor that we're interested in, right? And it's ordinal. Can I do an intra-class correlation for it? Several of you were in the generalized modeling class. Did we predict ordinal things with regression models in that class? Did we? Yeah? Can you do factor analysis predicting ordinal outcomes? Uh-huh. So can I make an intra-class correlation for my ordinal variable? Why not? This is one of the units that's forthcoming. So this is like foreshadowing that. Yeah. Residual variance is constant. Residual variance is. Uh, yeah. Like factor variance doesn't have to be. Random intercept variance doesn't have to be. Yep, yep. So I am doing MEO logit, mixed effects O logit for ordinal, which as a package I actually don't like because it's backwards, but I'm going to live with it for this unit. It provides, and if this sounds like gibberish to you, no worries. Thresholds, these coefficients are in logits. They are the logit of the probability of a lower response in a series of sequential submodels. So it corresponds to the probability of getting paid lunch rather than free or reduced, and the, and the probability of getting paid or reduced rather than free in logit space. But yeah, here's my random intercept variance. In models that predict binary and ordinal outcomes using a logit, that means that the residual variance in the model is not an estimated parameter. It is constant, and it's pi squared over 3. So to make an intra-class correlation, I did that manually by treating Stata as a typewriter, I, or typewriter, computer, calculator. That's what I was going for. See, I was going with old school technology, and I just picked the wrong word. This is my VHS player. And I have 1.79 for my intercept variance divided by that plus 3.29. So this is just to show you that you can do multi-level modeling on any kind of outcome that you could normally use a regression model on. And we will talk about the details of that uh, coming up later in the semester. So that coefficient works out to be, I have it in the R output here, 0.35. So 35% of the variance in this ordinal student lunch predictor is between schools. It's even higher than in math. In R, I found, I had to dig for this actually, it's a, a package called ordinal and they have a function that's CLMM, cumulative logit mixed model, I'm gonna guess. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Sure? Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Link so is logit, link. So what? It's link. DL is for oh, link. is it? Cumulative link? Link, yes. Okay, sure, why not? I guess they have probits in here, so they'd have to change the name of it. Uh, it yelled at me for a minute, and I figured out eventually that you have to pretend your variable is a factor if it's not already, so that's how I went around that. But otherwise, the formula looks the same in terms of fixed and random intercept for that. And R's estimate of the random intercept variance is very close to that of Stata, but not exactly right. So when we get to this unit in terms of homework, I'm going to have two different versions of it because the real estimates are not close enough. So that's why your very last homework is like labeled 5 slash 6 because you only have to do one of them based on which software package you pick. All right. 
And in R, I had to do a little bit of extra work to get a likelihood ratio test for that. Stata spit it out like normal right here, comparing the model without a random intercept variance. In R, I had to re-estimate a model without it and then compute the difference in minus 2 log likelihood and the p-value for it. So its test statistic is 2980, which agrees closely with the one from Stata. Not quite, though. So yes, point of the story, definitely school-level variance in math. Very large design effect we ought to make sure we do a multi-level analysis for. And the same is true for our ordinal predictor. It has a lot of school-level variance, so we need to be on the lookout for contextual effects. All right, how are we doing? Questions or anything I need to say again? Thank you, Zoomers. So let's see, to start with, what the impact of paid versus some kind of not paid lunch is. So this is just a binary predictor right now. It's difficult enough. Uh, I wrote it out. So the predictor in terms of the code is PVRF, which stands for paid versus reduced or free. And I am adding in a level one placeholder for its slope. Beta 1 then gets defined in the level 2 model by only a fixed effect right now. So the code looks very similar to what you've seen repeatedly. The fact that it's binary doesn't change anything because I'm treating it as a quantitative variable. 0 and 1 is only has a one unit change between it, so that's fine. So throw it into the fixed effects here in Stata, throw it into the fixed effects here in R. And then since Stata output looks much the same, I just printed the Elmer output for this. Okay, so these numbers, what's 27? 22 um, between schools. Yep, that's my differences between schools and mean math. That remains. 239 is what? Well, yeah, we don't know either of these things, but what does it represent conceptually? If 27 is differences between schools in mean math, yeah, yep, level one residual within school person to person differences, yes. Um, Nikki said that when she's spoken to some of you that the word between person creeps in, I would avoid that because it will make you confused. I try to reserve the word between for level two and the word within for level one. So person to person within school is level one, between schools is level two. And 50 is what? Right there. Hmm? Yeah, so fixed and intercept, that gives that much away. What does 50 mean? If I could put it in a sentence. That's the expected math score for the students who pay for lunch. That's right. Expected math score. And then we got to look at the list of predictors. When are they zero? For a student who pays full price. Cool. The slope associated with this new predictor, this is a fixed slope, is negative 9, which is wildly significant. What is that telling me? Paid is the reference group. So paid is zero, and reduced or free is one in this variable. Yes, children who get a discount of some kind at least are nine points lower on average. So in explaining the effect of a binary predictor, it's always how the one group differs from the zero group. You have to write it that way, otherwise the direction is easy to get confused. So this is the effect of not paying for lunch. Those children are lower by nine on average. In terms of explained variance, I have the pseudo r square donator function, thank you Jonathan again, or the one that I wrote in SAS, thank you me. 
uh, 40% of the random intercept school variance was explained by student lunch status. What? <laughs> uh, Chris says math goes down if they don't pay for lunch. That makes it sound almost causal. Like, if you want their math scores to increase, just give them more money. It's fine. No, I should not laugh. It's an unfortunate uh, real-world phenomenon. 40% of the school variance was explained by student math. Does that surprise you? Is that possible? Or is this a Trojan horse situation? Paid versus reduced or free lunch is a student characteristic. Nevertheless, it explained 40% of the school variance and only 5% of the student variance. Use more out. Yep, we got to do this. Right now we're this. We got to do this. Now let's put some words on it. So unsmush it. <laughs> got to unsmush it. And you can't write that in a paper, but what can you say? Add another level. Uh, different C word. You're in the right neighborhood, though. I need something to account for the clustering in this predictor, right? The fact that this is actually a school variable inside the student variable. Contextual, contextual yes. I need to add a contextual effect that accounts for the fact that schools could have a different effect of this variable than students. So this model is a smushed model. It is. This is assuming no contextual effect, that your math score has nothing to do with who you go to school with. Just, just you. That's it. Said differently, this model is assuming the within school effect of lunch is the same as the between school effect of lunch, because between minus within is contextual. In terms of effect size, is it correct to say that the model explained 40% of variance? Or do I need to be more specific? More specific. It's 40% of the random intercept variance. How much of that was there to begin with? 15%? 15. So the right way to think about this is that of the 15% that was between schools, my model so far has explained 40% of that 15%. So 0.4 times 0.15 is what I've got. Not as impressive. Likewise, my model has explained 5% of the initial 85% that was student differences. So let's fix it. I'm adding cluster mean paid versus reduced or free lunch, which I had made ahead of time because I knew I was going to need it, centered at 0.3. And I have a reminder here of how to get to the missing between effect, which is going to be implied by this model. Cough, cough, homework question. So there's my new cluster predictor, cluster mean student reduced or free lunch. And here it is in R as well. And I will make the point that because I only had a student level data set to work with, I had to get this variable by summing, averaging across the students. In a real analysis, this information is probably available in a more complete form, like at the district level or in any other sort of like formal reporting. And that variable would be a better version. That's going to break the exact tie of within plus contextual equals between because they're not based on the same information. But to the extent that the students who took this math test are not all the students in the school, arguably using data that covers all the students in the school would be better.
So this is not ideal, but it's what I could do. Um, the math isn't going to work out neatly because there may be a correlation between the, like if you tried to cluster mean center, because the mean is not based on just the cases in the data, those may not be completely orthogonal. So I think you, I would just describe it from a, like this is optimal from a measurement perspective, but you can still think of it as a contextual effect like conceptually as to what it represents. It's the extra effect of the school's composition after controlling for the student information. So I, I could still say it that way, but I probably wouldn't like do within plus contextual equals between because it's not the same variable that goes into those pieces. Not the same sample. All right, so here's my new output. I have the old model results here from the fixed effects to compare against. So a couple things I notice immediately my variance components, level two went down further by a lot. Level one is about the same. Is that surprising or unsurprising? Unsurprising? This is 50-50. It's actually an opinion question. So there's no wrong answer here. So the residual variance went down? Residual variance is about the same. Level two random intercept variance went down. Okay, we got two votes for surprise. Let me make sure. So it was 27 and 239 from the previous model. Now it is 13 and 239. So yes, level two changed quite a bit. Level one stayed the same. I got another vote for unsurprising now. Two votes for unsurprising. Remember, not vague, right? <laughs> Uh, let's see, three votes for not surprised. You're not going to weigh in? Not, okay, not surprised. She's like, don't make me talk. <laughs> <laughs> Zainab, what about you? Surprised or not surprised? Not surprised. Not surprised. I'm sensing a trans. Want to vote? Not surprised. Has everyone voted? Anyone want to change their answer? I would say that this is not surprising because the predictor that we added is a cluster characteristic. The only thing that it can do is explain cluster variance. So the level one student variance should be basically the same. It might wiggle a bit, but you should not see sizable changes. Yes, and a comment from the Zoomers, Chris says, it's also not surprising because there was so much variability in school composition with respect to free lunch. So there's a lot of information at the school level with respect to composition of this variable. Now let's see what happened in terms of the model. The intercept before was 50.6, now it's 50.6, okay. Does it mean the same thing though? It does not. Because intercept is always expected outcome for predictors equal zero. Now we've conditioned it not just on a student who pays for lunch, but what kind of school do they go to? 50% of students who produce or school. Yeah, 70% pay, 30% get some kind of discount. That's who we're talking about now. The level one effect is close, but not the same. So it was minus 9.4, now it's minus 9.2. Does it mean the same thing? Cough, cough, homework question. So, it's not that particular school. It's just right? Not yet. That's coming, but not yet. It's not conditional on this variable because they don't interact. Um, they're not interacting. So they, they both contribute as main effects. But this has changed what it means.
previously this variable had both level two information and level one information, right? We called it a smushed effect. Now this is the unique effect after controlling for the level two mean of the variable. What's uniquely offered by the level one predictor now? Testing for differences among people. Among people, differences among people. So the variance differs among people. Among people who go to the same school, specifically now. This is a within effect. Because we've controlled for what kind of school they go to right here. So I'll say that again. We've controlled for what kind of school they go to. So this is interpreted now as the student effect of free lunch between two students who go to the same type of school. Maybe not literally the same school, but just the same type. Same school composition is the way I would say that. So this is a purely within cluster effect right now. Students who get a discount of some kind are lower in math by 9.2 points. The smushed effect was close, but it was slightly more negative. Coincidence or consequence? Consequence, yeah. Why is it not unexpected? It, the answer is always consequence, that is true. But I want you to know why. Because that... Number the smush number has, mm -hmm. more, has more of the level one. It, it's level heavily two. more heavily related towards level one, but it does have level two in it, right? Mm -hmm. Remember the definition of a smushed effect what is right where my mouse is here. That is saying the within effect is minus 9.4, and so is the between. Mm -hmm. The contextual effect allows those to separate. The contextual effect is the difference of between minus within. The contextual effect is minus 16. That means the between effect would be minus 9 plus minus 16, which is this number right here, minus 26. So putting that all together, the smushed effect that assumes the within slope is minus 9 and so is the between slope is wrong. It's closer to what the within slope should be, which is actually this nine, minus 9.2. But it's biased more negative because it's being pulled by the more negative between effect of minus 26. So it's too negative relative to what it wants to be, which is less negative right here. How are we doing? So what does this thing mean, the minus 16? That's my contextual effect. Is it level one or level two? Hmm. Two. Okay. That's the incremental contribution of the cluster mean. In this case, the proportion of students after controlling for level one predictor, right? Exactly right. This is the incremental contribution of school lunch composition after controlling for student school lunch status. So if I take my kid and send him to a new school, for every unit more of this variable, school mean math goes down by 16. Now what's a unit? It means going from no poor kids to all poor kids. This is a proportion variable. That's why this number is so damn big. So to think about it more rationally, I can do this. Okay, watch carefully. Now it's per 10%. So for every 10% more kids, math at the school goes down by 1.6. 10 10% 10 times 10 puts me back to where I was. 
So you're allowed to break these into pieces that make more sense based on the scale of what's happening. But to keep it as the contextual effect, I have to keep it in the same proportion scale that the original binary predictor, when you take its average, becomes. So the previous model that explained 40% of the school variance did so thinking that the between effect should be this minus 9. My current model allows the between effect to be minus 9 plus minus 16 for the difference, and it's all the way up to minus 26. So the expected between school effect of free lunch went from minus 9 up to minus 26, which is where it wants to be. And now my explained variance relative to the empty model is up to 70%. So before, smushed model said the effect at the school level was minus 9. That much explained 40% of the school variance. Properly specified model separating within from between via the difference is contextual says the school effect between schools is all the way up to minus 26 from minus 9 and that gives us a reduction of 70 percent rather than 40. An increase of 30 percent from properly specifying the model. So moral of the story, smushed effects ruin your level 2 model, not your level 1 model. But if you really want to control for clustering properly, you care about the level 2 model, even if you don't think of it substantively in terms of predictors. We have to make sure the model has the right amount of random intercept variance in it to represent the dependency of students from the same cluster. Misspecifying level two predictors is going to result in the wrong amount of variance and therefore the wrong amount of dependency being baked into the model. The change of the level one R square, very small. So negative to or zero to three decimal places, even slightly negative. So wiggle as expected, but not a substantial change. Okay, put this back. How are we doing? Question, please. No, this is just a regular old dummy code. And that means it has all the level two variants in it still, which is why this is a contextual effect and not a between effect. Is there a reason it set up for this except for what? Yes. So the question was, why didn't I cluster mean center this variable as I prefer to do? Because it's binary. That's why. So if I cluster mean centered of this variable, let's say that I have a school that has, that's 50-50, then it would return possible values of negative 0.5 or 0.5, which means my intercept doesn't refer to an actual person anymore, and it's weird. It's not wrong, but it's weird to me. And weird to a lot of people who want to talk about the binary variable as the difference between 0 and 1. Now, cluster mean centering would give you the exact same within slope. It's just that the rest of it gets a little bit weird because it's still a one unit difference regardless of how you center it. But because it's binary, this is what people would want to do. People who are not me. So wrapping this up, this is the within effect now. At level two, we have a contextual effect. If we add them together, we get to the full between effect. Lisa, I have a quick question if you get a sec. Yeah. So the, scroll up a bit, would you, um, please? The 16 is huge, right? Yes, it and is. And that's because that's the change in math if you're in a school that has all kids that A versus all kids that don't, which realistically in a, doesn't make a lot of sense. Like Correct. The 10% the increments makes more sense to me. Like, yes. 10% more. How does that affect your pseudo R squared and all the stuff that you like derive from that? Does that change the story downstream if you do it 10% wise? Or no. no, 
No, so the only consequence if you, like you could recode this variable to make it per 10% as your unit, like you would have that opportunity, but then you can't add the minus nine and the minus 1.6 together to get the between effect because they're off, off scale. Got it. So Thanks. it's it's just to make that sort of within plus contextual equals between situation work. But when I would talk about it, and as you will see in the many, many pages from now, page full of words, that's the way that I did it. Talked about it as per 10%. So yes, if there's any part where you're like, could you say that again, and I don't say that again, it's probably written down at the end. Okay, 129, we're doing okay. It's gonna be all right. Okay, other questions? So now we've got my fixed effects of this variable specified. What does this model assume with respect to the Let's go with disadvantage of free lunch. The size of this disadvantage, what am I assuming about it across clusters? It's the same. Do you think it is? Do you think being a poor kid is different based on what school you might go to? Most likely, yeah. Could be. Is that an empirical question? Mm -hmm. Can I test it with this predictor? I could, like, like they would let me, but no, I don't want to. Because then I would create a random slope that's smushed because this predictor has both level one information and level two information in it. So regardless of the fact that I wanna keep my model phrased as within plus contextual by using constant centering, leaving this uncentered essentially in this case, I'm gonna add in a random slope for the cluster mean centered version instead. So this is the hybrid model that we talked about last week. So within cluster free and reduced lunch is what goes into the random side of the model, as noted in the state of code here. I've also added an extra option that wasn't needed before. Coview N says, hey, let school intercepts and school random slopes be correlated if they come from the same school. I usually leave this in my code no matter what so that I don't have to remember to put it in if I have a random slope and it will just say, I'm gonna ignore this option, which is fine. In R, however, scroll down, scroll down here. It don't, you don't have to say anything because it automatically estimates correlations among your random effects. So we don't need to say that option. Okay, so this is your first random slope model. So I have this sort of weird notation because the variable that the random slope is attached to is different than the variable that the fixed slope is attached to. But they do mean the same thing because they're both within variables. The fixed slope is within because I've controlled for the contextual effect. The random slope is within because I'm using the version of the variable that was cluster mean centered that only has within information. So here, I have both model outputs, since you haven't seen random slopes yet. I've highlighted the new pieces in the Stata output here. So we have one new variance up top, and we have one new covariance here. So 14 is my new random slope variance. That's the variance of the U2 terms across schools. The covariance with the intercept is minus seven. That means that the intercepts, which would be at the zero point of this new predictor that has a random slope, so sort of like when you're at the school's average, schools that have higher intercepts have less negative, hang on, more negative slopes, actually. It's that way. Because the slopes are negative. So if you think about the distribution of slopes, people at the bottom have the strongest slopes and people at the top have the shallowest slopes because it's this, this angle. This way for you guys? I can never get it right. All right, that way. 
Does 14 sound like a lot? I have a hard time with that. I'm like, is it different than zero? Well, confidence interval looks like it is. How do I test that more formally though? Raynova, yep, or LR test as it's known in Stata. So this chi-square right here doesn't help me anymore. Stata users, note that it has degrees of freedom three. What that is doing is kicking out the entire matrix of random effect variances and covariances. That's the three. So it's not testing the addition of the new thing. It's testing the addition of all of these things, including the random effects that were already there. So that's not helpful. We got to make our own. So a couple more pieces of output here. Make sure that I have the minus two log likelihood so that I could insert that into the homework system and or use it to compute a likelihood ratio test if needed. S stat recovariance relevel school ID correlation is a very long way to say I'd like the correlation between the intercepts and slopes instead of the covariance. So it's a negative correlation of 0.5. And then last but not least, estimate store. That saves the information from this model given a name of RAND. The previous model I did not mention, but also had an estimate store command. I called that one fix. Then I ask for an LR test, which stands for likelihood ratio test of RAND versus fixed. And it spits it out for me in the output. So LR chi 2 2 means likelihood ratio chi square with two degrees of freedom, has a test statistic of about 90 with a p-value that is significant to several decimal places. And then it gives you some helpful hints. Note, the reported degrees of freedom assumes the null hypothesis is not on the boundary of the parameter space. If this is not true, then the reported test is conservative. If you'd like to know more about what that means, I recorded a video yesterday that you can watch on Thursday because I didn't want you to be lonely without this class on Thursday because I know that you want to spend your fall break, you know, learning as we all do. So I finished out lecture four with respect to the estimation sections and a little bit about that. But what this means is that if you're testing variances that have to be positive, it's not really two full degrees of freedom. It's a mixture of one and two. The one is for situations in which the variance would have wanted to go negative, but it wouldn't let it. So the p-value that goes with this is slightly conservative. I can live with that. The other thing it's reminding you is that likelihood ratio tests based on Remmel are only valid if the fixed effects are the same. That's just a rule that you should know, and my sequence of demonstrating adding models is always making sure this rule is okay. We always add the fixed effects in one step, and then in a second step, add the random effects. That way, it's valid under Remmel or Emmel. Our folks, here's your new random slope. Here's your 14. So it lists the random intercept first, the random slope variance second, and it lists the correlation between the two out here. So it doesn't actually give you the covariance in the output, although you could probably dig for it and find it someplace. In terms of comparing the previous model, the within slope has shifted a little bit. It was minus nine and now it's minus eight. It has a different interpretation. Minus nine was in just pooling all the cases in the whole data set for that variable. The minus eight from the current model is the average slope across schools, given the random slope variance across schools that we added. So in the same way that the intercept is the mean of the school means, this is the mean slope across all the school slopes for this variable. Here's my RANOVA. Here's my test statistic of 90 for its addition. So yes, it's significant. And to help schools understand what the hell 14 means, same technique, 95% confidence interval. So the middle of it is the fixed slope of the minus eight, two times the square root of the variance for the slope. So there's my 14. So two standard deviations around the fixed slope gives me a range like this. 
So this makes a lot more sense in terms of what the random slope is telling us, that across schools, the deficit created by this disadvantage, whatever lunch is representing a proxy for, that deficit is expected to be as large as minus 15 in some schools and barely anything in others. Quite a bit of variability in how much being a poor kid sucks based on which school you go to. Another way to think about this is that this is school differences in equity. How equitable are the outcomes of students from different kinds? In some schools, there's not much difference if, a school get, if the student gets free lunch. In some schools, it's a big difference. So interventions or programs might want to try and increase math as a goal but it also might want to focus on discrepancies in math as a function of student characteristics as a separate goal. Last but not least, one more effect size that I can compute. Cough, cough, here it is in for your homework. Random slope reliability. I don't think I should call that nice. Copy and paste error, that should be SR for slope reliability. It is the random slope variance divided by that plus the residual variance, that part divided by the level one sample size and the variance of the variable the slope is for. So these numbers came from my output for the most part, I think. Hang on here. These numbers, actually I take that back. These numbers are wrong. This one is right though, because I did it in Excel. I'll fix those. I'll fix this part, the 0.6 works. So it's not that high of reliability actually, but it does look like a conceptually strong slope. Here's where the school mean, uh, the variance came from, that's the school mean of the variable times one minus the mean. That's how you get a variance for binary predictors. So, putting it all together. If you get free or reduced lunch, not so good for you. If you go to a school where more kids get free or reduced lunch, not so good for anyone at that school. However, the extent to which you have a disadvantage from getting free lunch differs across schools. So schools differ from each other in this model in two ways, in their mean math at the zero value of my predictor and in the extent of their disadvantage due to free lunch. That's what we've learned so far. I'm not done yet though. I'm done for today, but not done with this. I'm only on page nine out of 20. What's left, you say? Well, we gotta try and explain this additional source of variance. Why is it that some schools differ in the extent of their disadvantage? And we haven't even separated reduced lunch from free lunch yet. We gotta do that still too. but that's happening next Tuesday, not today. All right, questions or comments? Yes? So um, when you say there will be a video posted for us to watch? There is a video posted, already actually. There. It's already there. Yep, so there was a whole chunk of lecture four that I decided I was gonna send to video because I didn't think we'd have time. Um, so there's a few slides we have not done yet, which is like four in here, but then I did everything from 42 to the end in the video that I posted. It's about a 45 minute video. So you can watch that at your leisure. Um, it's, it's somewhat technical stuff in my overview of it. I just tried to describe like the, the main ideas as to why this matters and what you should keep out of it. But for those of you who are trying to learn things like, oh, I don't know, likelihood functions. Eh, yeah, I heard that was a homework assignment in another class to make up a likelihood function. For those of you trying to do things like this, I thought it might be helpful to see the, the underlying details. So that's what I did. All right, other questions, comments? Then let's call it a week. So go enjoy the rest of your garbage day. Have good, uh, have good times. Let me know if you have any questions about homework four. Thanks for being here. See you next week. Bye, Zoomers. <laughs>